Hey everybody, welcome back to Jim's Garage. In this video, I'm gonna tell you about an application that I've recently started using that has made all of my document management so much easier, especially for PDFs, and it's also helped me have a better green footprint. That application is paperless, and as the name suggests, it helps you to organize your documents. Now, one problem with PDFs is searchability, and paperless solves that. So no longer do I need to print off all of my PDFs. I can now dump them within paperless and it has some funky AI that automatically scans those documents. So I can do things such as searching for a document or a keyword within that document, even if the folder name or the file name itself is somewhat spurious. That's really powerful because as soon as you start to get an extensive library, it causes massive headaches trying to find the document that you want paperless it takes care of that it also has a load of advanced features i'm going to show you how to do single sign-on with paperless using authentic you can also do things like tagging of versions and also have revision history if you want to change those documents plus with some of the plugins it also supports microsoft office documents as well as other formats Anyway, let's jump straight into the configuration. We're gonna be doing this in Docker. And as always, I'm gonna walk you through all of the config steps, including single sign-on, and then I'll give you a brief overview of how to actually use this. So hopping over into VS Code for this walkthrough, I've taken the official documentation and I've enhanced it a little bit so that we've got things like single sign-on, but also we're gonna be using traffic labels to put this behind a reverse proxy so that we get nice friendly URLs and the good old green tick in the address bar. So there's quite a bit to get through here. And as you can see at the top, this uses a Docker compose file and we also call a dot environment file. Don't worry too much about that. That's simply to name the project. Most of what we're gonna focus on is in this here. So if we have a look down, we're gonna see first of all that there are multiple containers. So there's one for the broker, one for the database, one for the web server, and then there's some optional ones for Gothenburg and Tika. I'll come onto those in due course. So if we start from the top, the first thing we're gonna do is to deploy the broker and this uses the Redis image. Now we've used Redis before in previous deployments and the benefit of Redis is that it stores key value pairs within memory, which makes searching extremely fast compared to conventional methods that might use a hard drive. Now, there's nothing too much in there that we need to change. The only thing I've changed, and this is for all of the containers, is that I've put it on the network of paperless. That's because later on, I've put the web server onto the proxy network. If you don't know how to do that, go and check out my previous traffic videos. But with doing that, we need to create an internal network so that all of these apps can talk to one another on the same network. That's paperless. Moving on from Redis, we go onto the database. So you do have the option of using Postgres or MySQL. I've chosen Postgres because from all of my experience and from some of the benchmarks out there, it's far more performant. So in this case, we're simply doing a volume mount to mount the data for Postgres. This is just in Postgres data, and this is actually using a volume. You can use a bind mount if you want, and I've done that in most of my other videos. I'm just using a volume here to keep it simple and to again introduce the concept of volumes. I recommend, and I'll probably add this to my GitHub, to use bind mounts because I find them much easier to work with. After that, we're gonna set some environment variables, and these are just the username, the password, and the database name for the database that paperless, i.e. the web server, will connect to. Obviously, I recommend you go and change these values, especially if you're gonna be using this anywhere in a production environment. Moving on from here, and you can see it's back on that paperless network, we actually get onto the web server. So this is actually the service that you are gonna be interacting with through your web browser. And so we're pulling down the latest image and we've said that it depends on these four containers here. So as I've discussed before, what that means is this will not start unless those four containers are already available, which is really useful and it helps to make sure that things don't start up in the wrong order, i.e. it makes sure that the database is up and running first. Well, actually, it makes sure that it's started. It doesn't necessarily mean the container's healthy, but provided you follow something like a Docker Compose and it's a repeatable process with no human error, 
that shouldn't be an issue. Moving on from there, we get to the volumes. Now, in the volumes, there's a mixture here of actual Docker volumes, so data and media, but there's also some bind mounts, and this is just in dot slash notation. So this will actually put this within the folder that your Docker Compose file is stored in. And this is simply to have data, the media, the exports, and the consumed data. It's also going to use the .env file here. And if we have a look at that, this is just to give this thing a project name. So I've used the default of paperless, but you should be able to choose whatever name that you want. After that is where it starts to get a little bit interesting. So here you can see that we specified paperless Redis. And do go and check the official documentation for paperless because there are far more environment variables available that might better suit your setup or whatever you have in mind. This is just how I've got it configured for mine. So we specify the Redis, which because of Docker's DNS naming internally, we can just use the container name here. And because it's on that same network, that paperless network, it's going to find it on 6379. The database host is just DB, again, because it has that internal DNS name. After that, we've said that Tika is enabled. What's Tika? Well, Tika and Gothenburg are responsible for being able to pass emails and Office documents. As I mentioned at the start, this isn't just for PDF files. You can also make use of those other files as well, which is really handy if you're wanting an all-in-one self-hosted solution. Once we specify that, we simply need to state where those endpoints are. So again, Gothenburg, which is the name of the container and the port it's running on, and the same for Tika. Next, it starts to get a little bit interesting, and this is because I'm running it behind a traffic reverse proxy. The first thing I need to do is to specify a URL, and this is to stop cross-source request forgery, which is a protection measure within most browsers, and that is to specify the URL that I'm going to run this on. For this demonstration, I'm using paperless.jimsgarage.co.uk. The important thing here is you have to specify the protocol, so don't miss that out. And I've also created on my internal DNS a record for this, which points to the IP address of my traffic proxy on my Docker host. The next bit is where it gets a little bit more complex, so let's peel that away. So here we're saying that the paperless apps use an open ID connect as an option. So basically what this is doing is it's saying that you can use different social connections to be able to log in, i.e. it's going to be doing that OIDC, the Open ID Connect, which means that it can defer the authorization process to a separate application. In this case, I'm going to be using Authentic, but there are a myriad of different providers out there. You can even log into this thing with something like GitHub. Go onto their website and have a check and see which one you want to use. It might also work with things like Keycloak and Zitadel, which I've covered in previous videos before. But I recommend for a home lab, I think Authentic is probably the sweet spot. It does OAuth 2.0, OIDC, and it also does a web proxy for those applications that don't support either, which can be really handy because there's a lot of applications out there that don't have robust authentication methods. The next thing is where it gets a little bit more interesting. And this is where we specify the provider for paperless. So here you can see I have the authentic single sign on client ID, which is here, which I've generated in authentic. And I've also got the secret, which is also generated in authentic. And I've also specified the URL here, which is the URL I specified previously and is in my internal DNS records. But how did I get here? Well, I'm not gonna go exhaustively through authentic. I've done that in a couple of previous videos, but if I quickly show you how to configure this, then you can copy and paste those values into here and you should be good to go. So over in my authentic, I've created a provider. I've simply called it paperless. I've created an application conveniently named paperless which uses the provider that I just mentioned if you have a look in here you can see that the settings are all pretty straightforward and if you go to the providers and click edit on here you will see that it gives me the client ID which I just mentioned and also the client secret so you'll want to copy these and put those into that environment variable and also you want to put the redirect URI 
to be the paperless URL you specified and what you have in your internal DNS record. Like I said, I'm not going to go through this exhaustively because it follows the exact same process that I've done in my previous videos. So please go and check those out if you need more information. However, once you've watched those, copy and paste them in, put them into your config file and you should be good to go. So moving on from there, we've got the standard traffic labels that I put in most of my videos. The important thing here is it's running on the HTT port of 8000 but we're getting the nice convenience of having HTTPS to the proxy. And I've just specified here that same URL. Obviously you'll change this to whatever your domain is. Next, we get onto Gothenburg. There's nothing really to do here. Again, we just specify an image and we tell it to restart unless stopped. There's no data, there's no persistence here. And lastly, we have the Tika, again, which is similar to Gothenburg. There's no persistence and they both reside on that paperless network. At the bottom, we've got those volumes that I mentioned previously, and we could choose to use bind mounts if you want to do that. And then lastly, we specify all of the networks that we're gonna use for deploying our containers. Chiefly, it's that paperless, which is that internal only network, i.e. nothing external can connect to that. But we have the proxy, which is external true, it's created elsewhere and it's exposed through our traffic container so that anything within our network or off our network if we port forward can access this service. So now let's hop over to our Docker host and let's spin this up. Thankfully, if you've been watching my other videos, you know that we can just remote into that now through VS Code. So I'm gonna to connect to that Docker host right now. Now that I'm connected, we should be able to go to our folder. So I'm gonna to go to my home and I've copied both of those files from VS Code over to here. And this is exactly the same as the run through we just went through. So now, thankfully, we can go into the terminal. I can migrate to this folder. And hopefully, I can just run a single sudo docker compose up dash d, and we should get this running. So that's now going to go away and create all those containers. The first time you do this, it will have to pull them. I've spared myself some editing by downloading these images already. But now, if I go to paperless.jimsgarage.co.uk, I should be greeted with the initial configuration page. Let's go and have a look at that. And here we are, we get the login page. Now, one thing you'll notice is the gray button. If you haven't set up single sign-on, you'll only get the sign-in button, but because we've specified authentic, we get authentic single sign-on. So let's give that a whirl. I'll click authentic single sign-on. It's now gonna take me to authentic, so I'm gonna log in here with my username and password. Once I put in my password, Hopefully I can click return and it's gonna redirect me back to paperless and log me in as that user. So now I can click sign up and now I'm logged into paperless as that user. You can see in the top right, I'm authentic. Now, if you do that, you're gonna notice that you're logged in, but you're not an admin. That's because we need to first create the admin account and then set this one to be an admin. So let's log out. Now, a quick edit. I've added two additional parameters to my GitHub config, which I didn't go through in the initial walkthrough, but those are to specify a default admin username and password. So if you've already gone ahead and deployed this, you won't be able to use that. You'll need to delete the containers, delete the volumes and just spin this up again. But if you followed my guide, the default is paperless and paperless. And when I log in with this user, we are logged in as the administrator and we know that right away because we've got all of these additional options down on the left. So if we want to have the benefits of single sign-on, let's go to users and groups and let's edit this user here. And I'm going to make this one a super user. Now it's a super user. I'm going to hit save down in the bottom right. That's now saved. So we can hopefully now log out and now sign in with our single sign-on. And with any luck, yep, we're an admin user. Perfect. So let me give you a very quick tour of how to use this. I'm not gonna dive into all the features. Please go and read the documentation. But just to demonstrate this, I've downloaded a few PDFs that should demonstrate some of the core functionality. So the best way to look at this is to go through the guided tour. I'm not gonna do that, but I recommend you do. But quite simply, all you need to do to make this work is to drag and drop some files 
into this window you see here. So here I've downloaded a bunch of PDF files and I'm just going to do a couple to demonstrate but in the background I'd probably do all of these. Now I'm going to drop those there and you'll see immediately behind my face that it started to upload. And you can see that the first thing it's doing is once it's completed the upload is processing the document. So this is where all of the magic starts to happen. It's actually looking through those documents, it's reading the text and it's trying to analyze some of those images to generate some metadata attached to that document. So to demonstrate that process, you'll see that these file names are pretty obscure. They just look like to be random characters for the PDF. Now, that's not very useful, but it is indicative of lots of PDFs you will download, which often have file names associated to a particular system or maybe a customer record or maybe some other scheme. But when you actually want to search for stuff, that's where paperless can come in. If you know the content of what you're looking for, so that will become clear in a moment, these are data sheets for Warhammer 40,000. So if, for example, I wanted or I knew a character name, but I didn't know which PDF it was in, hopefully I can type in the character name at the top and with any luck, that should show up. So this can take a little bit of time and it will be dependent on how much CPU you give this container. I'm gonna let this process in the background and I'll see you in a second once that's completed. So now you can see it's dynamically updated on the right. The last thing it did was to generate a thumbnail. But now I've got one document, the other one's still in progress, and I've got 44,066 characters in that document. So at least most of it, or hopefully all of it, has been read. So now if I look in documents, you'll see that it's here. And this is army rules for Death Watch. But you can see actually the file name is just this. So if this was in your typical Windows environment and you wanted to search for it, it wouldn't be of much use. So I don't know, let's have a look. You can also click the I here to make this big and just view it as a regular PDF. But let's say for example, let's zoom in. Um, the word Terminator. Let's copy this and go back to the search. Now, hopefully with any look, I can paste that in. And yeah, there we go. It's already a search term that's populated from this document. So if I click that, it's pulled up this as the only one. Now, I'm going to wait until the second one's uploaded. So we'll see two documents here. And then I'll do that search term again. Hopefully, we should only get one document showing, proving to us that it's able to look inside the documents and enable us to have this advanced search functionality. So now back on the dashboard, you can see that I've got two documents and that total character count has almost doubled. So now if I head back to my documents, you'll see that I've now got two here. And if I now paste into here and click return, you'll see that it only matches the one document. That's great. That means we're now able to search all of our files within paperless. That's really helpful for things like PDFs. So that's a very basic overview of some of that functionality. You can obviously do things like changing permissions between users, which is really cool. And you can also do things like tagging documents yourself. So you can add a tag. So let's go back to here. We can edit this and we can add a tag. We can click the plus and then, I don't know, let's say test and click save. Now that this is tagged, we can hit save. And then hopefully we'll be able to filter everything by a tag. So let's click tag and then we click test and then it's already there. So we can then reset the tag by doing that and then both are going to show up. So there's a very quick whistle stop tour of some of the functionality. Please do go and read up on the documentation. There's a ton more stuff you can do in paperless. So thanks for watching everybody. Hopefully that gave you a quick overview of how to host paperless with single sign-on behind a reverse proxy and give you a demonstration of some of the basic functionality, which I think is a real godsend, especially when you're dealing with multiple documents that are probably in things like PDF or Word format and you want to have a single searchable solution with some advanced permissions around them. Let me know if this is something that you're going to use and what your use case might be. If you like this video, please give it a thumbs up, hit that subscribe button, and I'll see you on the next one. Take care, everybody.